the Cambridge Union. Beyond Profit, for those of you who don't know, is a student-run organisation specialising in careers and, uh, careers and entrepreneurship in the social sector. We've run a series of events over the year, and this is our final of this year. And we're delighted to have someone of such a high profile as Sir Terry Leahy here to give his lecture on the role of big business in society. I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming him to the lecture. Thank you, uh, Hugo, and it's uh, a pleasure to, to be here to address the uh, annual lecture of uh, Beyond Profit, which is such a, an exciting and successful new society at the university. And uh, my son uh, told me that uh, Varsity provided some welcome publicity for the uh, for the talk uh, on their website with a with a picture of yours truly. Uh, unfortunately, the caption read "male prostitute arrested for blackmailing." <laughs> I want to reassure you, is referring to some of the story. <laughs> well, good evening. It's improper to expect organisational conduct to conform to the ordinary principles of morality. We cannot and must not expect formal organisations or their representatives acting in their official capacities to be honest, courageous, considerate, sympathetic or to have any kind of moral integrity. Not my words, uh, but those of the philosopher John Ladd. And I have to tell you, that even in this seat of learning, he couldn't be more wrong. This talk considers business's role in society and addresses the question, can big business have a positive role and what is it? I will assert that yes, uh, business can be a positive force. I will acknowledge that it may not automatically be so, and I will argue that for long-term success, uh, a business must intend to be a positive force. Indeed, I contend that with the correct purpose, business is at times the most effective force for social good. The most commonly understood uh, purpose uh, for business is profit, the exchange of goods and services for profit. Now this has come to mean financial profit for the firm, uh, and this is the basis of the concern for some people, uh, that it's a narrow pursuit of financial gain for your firm without concern for the net gain or loss outside the organisation. But profit can also mean surplus, and in that wider sense, it's been central to mankind's material and social progress from the very beginning of civilization. Among the things that set our species apart is the ability to use collective knowledge through communication and also to exchange, exchange physical goods and services. Now this has allowed specialization. And this in turn has enabled the creation of surplus from that specialization, which of course has meant that there is something to exchange, something physical to exchange. It's this specialization and exchange which has been the very basis of growth in output that has allowed us to stop being hunter-gatherers. There'd be no iPad here today if Steve Jobs had to use all his own calories, collecting calories in order to subsist. It's been this specialization which has enabled energy, capital, technology to be harnessed to our own labor to transform productive output and all that that in turn has made possible in terms of population growth, growth in life expectancy and material well-being. Business, indeed big business, 
is that process in its modern form. And it still is the case that it's business, the pursuit of profit, that drives productive growth within communities, within commercial sectors, in nations, and in global trade. The question, though, uh, arises, what guides business, what guides business in this pursuit of profit? Uh, one school, Adam Smith, Milton Friedman, might suggest that it best guides itself. To quote the great man from Kakadi, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, the brewer, I might add the grocer, that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Or as Friedman put it, the social responsibility of business is to make profit. They meant that each of us attempting to maximize our own profit is the best condition for maximizing the common good. Indeed, both are skeptical of more altruistic motives. To quote Adam Smith again, I've never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. Their view, as uh, Keynes said, is the belief that the most wicked of men will do the most wicked things for the greatest good of everyone. Now the second school has the same starting point, that firms pursue objectives uh, that are rational and purely economic, but that it's law and government, rather than any invisible hand of the market, that ensures the common good. Both views interestingly, embed morality in the system itself, not in the corporation. In their view, the corporation is a passive actor. But the good pastor and Matthews of the Harvard Business School believe there's a third guiding hand. Corporations themselves, they observe, do have a conscience and do exercise moral judgments. And they applied the same test of moral responsibility used for an individual to a corporation's behavior. <coughs> First, responsibility for actions. In this sense, does the corporation accept accountability for behavior? Second, do they accept and abide by rules and uh, rules of conduct? And third, do they exercise uh, moral judgments in their decision making? weighing the impact of their behaviour on others. Now by those tests, the authors believe corporations exhibit a conscience which guides their behaviour. And I would go further and say that actually big business does so more than the individual. Far from being uh, a moral vacuum, as John Ladd suggested, the firm's behaviour reflects the collective moral judgments of all of its stakeholders, admittedly to varying degrees, but of all of its stakeholders. And the public nature of these roles demands more considered judgment and responsible action than in the sphere of the private individual. When you're running a big business, uh, you can't afford the luxury of a thoughtless word or deed that might be permissible in private life. So which of uh, the three arguments best describes how businesses are actually guided today? Well, in the real world of business, of which I've experienced over 30 years here and around the world, the behaviour of business is guided, but by elements of all three, each compensating for the limitations of the other. There are limits to the invisible hand of the market, uh, though not as many as some would argue. But markets often struggle uh, to measure externalities, as we uh, can see with carbon emissions, and also when actors in the market don't behave uh, rationally on the information that they have, and therefore don't correct markets to keep them in equilibrium. And of course there are plenty examples of that in the recent banking crisis. 
Government, regulation, rule setting can and does help create markets and helps them to function in a better, fairer way. The challenge always is to agree on the right regulation and the right amount. And the political machinery and institutions necessary to create and sustain the right regulation is hard to shut down once it's operating and inevitably uh, you end up with too much regulation and not of the right sort. Regulation which intervenes in markets to control behaviour and outcomes, some of which have little to do with the market itself, more often than not cause the market to malfunction and produce perverse outcomes. The two systems are not perfect, don't always get the best from each other. And that's why a business should, and most do, navigate the shortcomings uh, by exercising their own responsible judgments. For example, between long and short term markets, uh, or beyond markets, or where there are gaps in rules, or where rules conflict uh, within legal systems or between legal systems. Navigating uh, a business is a lot easier uh, if you understand clearly what the business exists to do. <clears throat> As I've already said, the start point for all businesses is the creation of profit, of surplus. Now that tends though not to be the end point. If you look at a businesses on their website, a businesses self-declared purpose for existing, the very basis for their existence, they seldom only say uh, it's to create financial profit. It would appear that that's necessary, but not sufficient. Now you could be cynical uh, and say that the wider purposes uh, claimed are just window dressing, but I don't believe that would be right. There is a sense that for businesses to sustain over time, their objectives have to, be, have to mean more to stakeholders, particularly to employees, than the pursuit of financial profit alone. Now at this point I should ask you to ponder the uh, core purpose of Tesco. And uh, before you ponder too long, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can get it up on screen here. <coughs> So that's, I don't know if you can see it actually, but, but, but Tesco's core purpose is to create benefit for customers to earn their lifetime loyalty. To create benefit for customers to earn their lifetime loyalty. It's not about the number of shops, it's not about market share or growth or profit. The basic idea is that if we understand people's lives and how those lives are changing, and what new needs are arising for people as a result. And we respond with useful products and services which help make life easier for people. We'll be rewarded with that customer's loyalty over time. And loyal customer is the best basis for profitable business performance. It, it's actually the meaning that lies behind every little house. Let's see if I can get uh, another slide up for you here. These are the, the values of Tesco. Um, don't worry too much if you can't read the, the detail, but I just want to talk to you about how they came to be. They weren't handed down from on high or from a consultant or out of a textbook. About 15 years ago, we took thousands of our staff from all parts of the business, shops, warehouses, offices, and all levels. And we split them into small groups and spent a day with each group. The whole thing, the whole process took uh, over a year. And we asked them just two questions. From your experience of Tesco, having worked in Tesco a long time, what do you think the business stands for? What do you think are the values of the business? And the second question was, what would you like Tesco to stand for? And their answer to the first question was, the first value, no one tries harder for customers. That was their experience of working in Tesco. And their answer to the second question was, treat people as you 
would like to be treated yourself, the golden rule. And that's how we've tried to run the business, based on service and simple respect. And these are attractive, they're universal values, uh, they work around the world in all cultures and religions, uh, and people can believe in them. And I can tell you they've been a very big part, a central part, of our uh, success over the years. How do you, though, link high-level abstract goals like these actually to the work that people do every day to breathe life, breathe meaning into these uh, sentiments? Well, this is the Tesco steering wheel. And it's actually quite famous. And for the management students, you'll know it as a balanced scorecard. And what it does is it allows us to break any goal, no matter how big or how abstract, down into simple targets that apply to any level of the organization, any country, any store, any department, so that anyone uh, who comes to work each day can see what they have to do uh, and how they can make a difference, how they can contribute to these higher level uh, goals. Now the measures change a lot uh, over time from big to small, but the segments don't change. They're always the same. What can we do for the customer? How can we improve things for the customer? Uh, what can we do for the community? How can work be improved? Actually, the big source of productivity in a business like Tesco is actually just innovation in working practices. What are we doing for our people? We're an employer of 500,000 people. They create the brand. What are we doing for our people? and what financial targets do we have. So you can see it's not just financial targets. Uh, and all of the targets are given equal weight. And there's a strong emphasis on balance so that no target is ever pursued too narrowly at the expense of the others. The big skill in this is keeping a balance over the long term between the targets. Now the steering wheel in Tesco originally had just four segments. And the fifth, around community, was added because we came to realize that while Tesco's entire business success stemmed from its relentless focus on customers and their needs, as our own staff said to us, these same customers, of course, were also citizens, members of communities. And they told us that they wanted Tesco to do something more <coughs> for them, more for their community, as well as serving them simply as customers, which they recognised that we did very well. So we didn't want our response to that to be window dressing. So we placed it right at the centre of how we run our business, right in the middle of our steering wheel. So its importance would be clear to everyone in Tesco. This isn't an add-on, a CSR add-on. This is a change fundamentally to how the business operates and what it is here to do. Now, I, I suspect neither the market system or the rule-based system I spoke of earlier would be wholly sufficient in guiding a business in such decisions. You don't have to do this sort of thing. Uh, and it's hard to calculate the benefits in specific financial terms. It's a judgment that the company makes about what conduct is appropriate and likely to contribute to long-term prosperity and survival. We have a community plan that sets out our strategy and plans, and I can tell you is as professionally managed in all of its elements as every other part of the steering wheel. Uh, we've chosen four areas uh, to work on. Uh, local community work, because we're present in so many locations around the world. Uh, we work on education, the second. On diet and health, of course, related to our core business. And on climate change. Now, these are not randomly chosen CSR initiatives. They address the environment our business operates in and of the environment our business affects and is affected by. By making a contribution in these areas, we can benefit the long-term health and viability of the business itself. So it's an extension of the business. Climate change is an obvious example. Tesco sits in the middle of the consumer supply chain, 
which has produced a miracle in material well-being in the West in the, in the 20th century, but of course is based on fossil fuels. <coughs> uh, and now we know now that that's not sustainable, and we know it at a time when Asia wants the same, demands the same material progress. So we have to have a revolution in consumption, a second revolution in consumption, a revolution in modern supply chains, rebuilding them so they decouple uh, consumption from fossil fuels and other depleting natural resources. It's an enormous task, uh, but we've set out firm targets and clear plans to halve our own emissions by 2020 and to get to zero emissions by 2050 within our company. And we're ahead of schedule, actually. Uh, and we've also set targets beyond our company in collaboration with farmers and manufacturers to cut emissions in our supply chain around the world to 30% by 2020. And we've also set to work with customers to help them reduce their emissions by 50%. I can tell you it's taken huge investment, many new technologies, lots of global collaboration, whole new measurement systems, whole new accounting systems, and making and using all of the marketing techniques developed for a consumer society and applying them to this challenge. The key, of course, is to make sustainable consumption desirable uh, to people, desirable to consumers. If consumers want it, business will invest to respond with new products and services which are sustainable, and it mandates government. Government feel mandated to act to create the framework uh, that demands uh, and facilitates change. Now business uh, is of course part of the problem, certainly part of the problem, but it's also very much part of the solution uh, as well. And its ability to innovate, to work globally, to take risk, uh, means that it's one of the most effective forces in the move to sustainable consumption. Governments, and indeed now many NGOs, increasingly recognise that business can be an effective partner in achieving social objectives. Uh, businesses uh, are present in many communities, uh, they have thousands of employees, uh, very skilled uh, people, uh, and millions of customers. They're good at communications, they're good at motivating, uh, and they're highly disciplined organisations, um, effective at getting things done. So it's natural in areas such as sustainability, skills training, or education, or issues such as diet and health, that governments look to recruit business in support of their manifesto for social change. Business can certainly uh, be a force for good. Why then is it not always so? How does one explain the dark satanic mills, the destruction of rainforest, the excesses which led to the financial crisis? Well, I'm afraid I don't have uh, a simple answer. In banking, it was a cocktail of inattentive owners, poor governance, uh, and perverse incentives. With environmental bad business such as rainforest destruction, its ineffective government, market failure to cost externalities, an absence often of better economic alternatives, and sometimes gaps in scientific knowledge. Fundamentally though, I think a lot of the explanation lies in the context business operates in. The moral standards exhibited in business will inevitably reflect the moral standards of society at that time. Now, I'm not saying that society gets the business it deserves, <coughs> but there's an element of truth in that sentiment. In many, uh, perhaps most cases, the picture's complicated uh, because business brings both benefits and costs at the same time. Uh, the market system forces painful uh, reallocation of assets in response to market signals uh, in, in, and in an almost Darwinian way, the best adapted survive. Now in a competitive system, there are losers as well as winners. 
overall progress comes because the benefits outweigh the costs. Uh, but if you're losing, it doesn't look like that. Benefits and costs are, always, are not always easy to measure. Uh, and uh, we see examples where the full costs have not been measured. So finally, if we look into the future, where will the balance lie? Uh, will the contribution of business be more or less positive than today? Will all businesses seek growth in the broadest sense? Growth in, in, in the broadest sense. I've never come across a business that was created with a purpose and objective to get smaller. Now just coming out of uh, a global recession, it may appear that growth is hard to come by, but in fact there are very strong dynamic forces for growth which exist through, survive the economic cycles and which businesses try to catch hold of as if they were uh, trade winds. These are my these are my seven drivers of growth, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick word of explanation on each of those. Now, on trust, in a complicated world, an increasingly complicated world, consumers navigate by trust, by institutions, <coughs> people, brands that they trust, and they give their custom to businesses and institutions they feel they can rely on. And that's why brand management is so important today. Because of Moore's Law, both businesses and consumers have more information on each other than ever before. And properly used, uh, it can enable enormously productive exchange. On health, if you look at it in a basic anthropological sense, people want to look good, and live forever. Uh, and they'll be attracted to goods and services uh, which promise these things. Convenience, people feel busier than ever before. They're not often actually busier than before, but people feel uh, busier than ever before. And they're drawn to any product or service which saves time. Witness the boom in internet home shopping. Simplicity, now people, uh, <coughs> a lot because of uh, Moore's Law, because of uh, convenience, they have more choice than ever before. Uh, but what they really need more than choice is a problem solved. That's what people go out looking for, a problem that they have to be solved in a simple and satisfying way. So successful products and services will be those that actually satisfy completely a need. You take the ATM machine or the mobile phone, these are brilliant examples. Uh, of that. On loyalty, it may surprise you that uh, most businesses and much business effort, perhaps most business effort, chases the promiscuous customer, indeed re rewards disloyalty uh, and promiscuity. But business relationships that are built around loyalty are much more rewarding emotionally and economically for <coughs> both parties. And finally, sustainability. Now the question in business, until very recently, always used to be, as a business, can I be green and grow? In the future, you will have to be green <coughs> to grow. Government and regulation will require it, and consumers will demand it. So these are the forces uh, which will motivate business in the future. Uh, and you can see that at least five of the seven the exceptions uh, perhaps being convenience and simplicity, but at least five of the seven will be very much built around a business's reputation. More than ever before, businesses will rely on their reputation as a source of growth and prosperity. Indeed, it may well become the source for many businesses. Uh, and I want to conclude my presentation on this point. I believe uh, that for long-term success, the vast majority of businesses uh, must intend to be regarded as a positive force for good. Less a case of doing well by doing good, and more a case of doing good or not doing well at all. Thank you very much.
which I'm going to uh, moderate uh, <laughs> conveniently. And, uh, but please feel free to ask uh, uh, any questions uh, on, on any subject, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. You stated in effect towards the end of your standard talk that all this is inspired. It is a good thing, um, and uh, you can look at growth in a sense of what, what businesses are doing, like any other entity, are looking for survival. And uh, as you know, uh, that's how we try to survive, by growth, um, by, by um, uh, the survival of the fittest. Um, in competitive markets, there's creative discussion, there's dis destruction, there's winners and losers. And um, the, 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 there is a net <coughs> benefit, there is unquestionably a net benefit, um, as I tried to say earlier, in the progress of mankind. But, it, but it's not all one way. You know, there are costs and painful adjustments that take place as part of that progress. By the way, not everybody... Uh, uh, in the city of Cambridge uh, has that view of Tesco. Uh, but, but just let's sit with that view for the moment. Um, Tesco will, will come into a high street um, and actually uh, its presence or absence there is determined by laws and regulation. So, so that if, if the uh, uh, elected officials do, do not wish to have Tesco, then Tesco won't be there. <laughs> but, but, if, but if they're given democratic permission, then they can open business along with anybody else. Now, in the nature of our business, we just open our doors. That's all we do. And people have lots of other choices. They really do, of other types of supermarkets, of other types of businesses. And we won't stay in business <coughs> if people choose to go elsewhere. We can only stay in business if people choose to go to Tesco. Now, your point about monopoly, I mean, this is looked into on a regular basis by competition authorities because people are concerned when they see a big successful company to know that it's actually trading fairly and that its success is not at a cost to the public, what they call the public interest, the wider public interest. And actually, Tesco has been given a clean bill of health on ev at every inquiry, as have supermarkets, uh, and, and they are officially recognized as being competitive, dynamic, innovative, and well-liked by people. Not by everybody. Uh, actually, if you want to know, um, about 5% of the population of the country does not like supermarkets. And about 95% thinks they're actually rather good. Now, 5% of 60 million people is still a lot of people. It's 3 million people. And in a democracy, three million people have a right to make a noise, and they should. But as long as you remember that that is a very strongly held view, but it's not the only view. There's another view. And um, you will get this in all markets. You know, is Apple too strong? Is Microsoft too strong? Um, you know, uh, are Toyota too good at what they do? And in, in, in the end, that, that's got to be, as I said earlier, it's got to be governed <coughs> by uh, rules and regulations and also governed by markets, the individual choices of, of, of ordinary people. May I come back for a moment to those companies you mentioned <coughs> don't directly alter the environment of people living in the street. Uh, the presence or absence of Tesco or I mean, local monopolies have been looked at the same way, and there are not local monopolies. 
But I, I'm not sure I agree with you about that because if you go back, you know, the, the mode of transport used to be done at the end of the village street. The blacksmith did it. It doesn't happen now that all the cars are made in Japan. You know, um, these, these products and services, they all affect how we live. You know, the, the, the internet has made possible shopping from home. You don't have to have a shop on your high street. It can come from a warehouse somewhere in the middle of the country. They all have an effect. Not all of it good, but on average, good. Um, something similar to the gentleman was referring to his growth, and you talked at the end about how you think that it's necessary to go green to grow and to vice versa. And I was just wondering whether, um, in terms of Tesco, maybe you could provide us with an example, is this motivation um, mainly due to reputation and maybe consumer perception of their choice to choose you because you're green? Or do you think it's actually advantageous in the long term, um, despite being much more maybe expensive in the short term to do so? No, it's not greenwash. Um, I'll tell you how it came about. Um, in my experience, the vast majority of people in business want to do the right thing. Uh, and they believe that the business they conduct is for good. And um, when the science became incontrovertible, that the modern consumerism, based on fossil fuels, would do irreparable damage to the future, that was like a road to Damascus moment for a business like Tesco. Because you realize the good that you thought you were doing today would come at a price for our children that they couldn't pay. So this is a profound thing. And we realized that we had to change completely the way that we did business. This wasn't window dressing or greenwash. This was appreciating that we were doing business in the wrong way. And that only became possible through the science. You know, go back 10, 20, 30 years, people didn't realize <coughs> the effect of using uh, energy in that way. And, and as I said earlier, most material progress has been combining energy to humans. So we have to find a, a new way of doing that. And uh, what I would say is it's brought forward a flood of innovation in ideas and technology and everything else. And we've made enormous progress. And just down the road here in Ramsey in Cambridge, we opened the world's first zero carbon supermarket last year. And to all intents and purposes, it's the same modern supermarket that ever existed, but it's able to run on zero carbon. And is that just zero carbon in terms of Tesco's operations, or does that include the fact that you provide the material service? No, no, no. That's just Tesco's operations. So we then have the challenge of our global supply chain, which of course we don't own. I mean, this is owned by other manufacturers and farmers all over the world. So we can't make them do anything, but we're working very hard in collaboration to set shared targets to reduce the emissions in the global supply chain. And we're having great success in that. Well, one of the main ways of doing it is to create a universal system of measurement of the carbon footprint of a product, the carbon accounting. Uh, and that's, that's a, a, a world-leading breakthrough. It's, it's, it's the UK leaders, world leaders, and uh, that's allowing hotspots in the global supply chain, uh, carbon hotspots, to be measured. And uh, we work with uh, a huge organization uh, called the Consumer Goods Forum, companies like Procter & Gamble, and Nestle, and Walmart, and Tesco, and others. There's $3 trillion of turnover. These are very brilliant people around the world. Uh, and they're setting targets for redu reducing uh, carbon emissions for reducing, in fact, removing the impact on deforestation and, and many other uh, things. And similarly, on the consumer side, actually, we as individual consumers are responsible for most uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and so working with, but we're the communicators with, with the consumers, and working with them, we can encourage them, motivate them to make changes in their lifestyle that can dramatically affect carbon emissions, how they recycle, how they travel, how they insulate their homes, what products they choose, things like that. Um, uh, and we can have a big impact. On, on a more personal note, you, during your time at Tesco, you oversaw huge innovations, the club cards, home delivery, huge international expansion board, uh, an employee base of 500,000 today. How do you oversee that? How do you steer it? And how do you make sure the people at the top of the organisation who are making these realisations ensure that's spread out throughout your network? 
because to be operating in so many countries, the market leader in so many places around the world, to be able to do that and have that kind of impact and reach must be very difficult. Well, you, you can't, um, retailing is a very local business, food cultures are very local, so, so you can't control a business like Tesco operating in China and Hungary and, and America and the UK from the centre. You, you can't have lots of little rules that you expect to uh, be applied all around the world. So it's actually more important that you have broad principles, broad values that, that, that you operate by. And, and what you hope to bring about is that in any situation, the Tesco officer in that situation would react as you'd hope they'd react to a set of circumstances. Uh, and that's all you can, that's all you can do. From behind that, uh, you say yes. Yes, sir. Uh, apart from the ban on FDI and not to grant retail, what are the real obstacles for Tesco and its competitors in the Indian market? Um, well, the, the, the first, that, that you can't actually invest in India uh, as, a, as a foreign retailer at this stage. That there are ways that you can invest in collaboration with others. So for example, Tesco can own a cash and carry, we can own a supply chain, uh, we can franchise our skills to other retailers. There are, there are ways you can gain experience and we are. The, the, the big challenge in India is building the infrastructure uh, so that you can get fresh food uh, products efficiently through to the consumer. Um, but also to reassure the society that the development of modern retail will be in their interest. Back to the earlier question, actually, that, that, that there will be a net gain for people. What type? Uh, actually, a lot, a lot, because in, in terms of human behavior, if you step forward as an individual in an organization and say, I think we should do this, and you, you, you try hard but you get it wrong, if, if you get fired, nobody else is ever going to step forward. So, so you have to show as an organization that if you want people to take risks, you have to be able to cope with failure. And actually in business, it's interesting, business can survive lots and lots of failure and can, can, can accommodate lots and lots of risk, as long as you don't risk the entire company, interestingly, which is where some of the banks got it wrong. Uh, and, and so it's quite a good environment <coughs> for encouraging lots of trial and error and lots of failure. And people sometimes say to me, you know, lots of things have gone right in Tesco, but what do you regret? What really went wrong? And that's looking at it the wrong way. Failure and success are this part of the same process. Uh, and the failures actually often bring forward the successes. Lots of things that we started, little express stores, actually, like you spoke about earlier, were failures to begin with. We, very difficult to get them to work. But gradually we worked away and, and they become a big success. Do you see yourself as having a role in society <coughs> now that you've uh, stepped down from your position in Tesco through and the lessons that you've learned from being there? Well, I saw myself as having a role in society in Tesco. <laughs> uh, and, and to some extent, that's what I've tried to say, that actually, if you want to change society, being in a business is a great place to do it. Be just because there's so much resource at your disposal, so many skills, so much reach, so much influence, and uh, this is what governments and NGOs are also concluding, that, 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 that you know, these are very effective vehicles for <coughs> positive social change. Also, as an individual, so outside of Tesco, a, a, an individual business person has a lot of clout. You have a you have big contact book, you know, lots of experience of doing things. And I, and I, I know from talking to some of you, um, it's this transfer of management expertise into the area of social uh, entrepreneurship and charity, which is, which is very interesting and you're going to see a lot more of, I think, in the future. So, uh, 15 years ago, when, you, when Tesco adopted its values, 
Did the end consumer actually find any tangible difference in their experience with Tesco? Or was Tesco pretty much on the same as it was previously on the free market principles? They, 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 well, it was still run on free market principles, but the consumer did notice a difference because uh, what it produced was a more motivated employee, uh, a bit, a, a, an employee who thought the business stood for something. Ours is a low margin business. Most of our employees you know, are not on high wages. We pay them as well as we can, better than anybody else. We have the best pay in the sector. And the success we have, we give back to employees with share options and profit share, these sorts of things. But at bottom, you know, it's not the highest paid sector. So people come to work not just for the pay. They come to work for more than that. Uh, and this gave them something to believe in. And then customers noticed that because they had uh, happier, more engaged, uh, more dedicated employees giving better service. So I'll go back to the back there. In, in the blue, yeah. I think, I think you'll find it's not the case, actually, that 80 or 90% of the people said they didn't want a Tesco. You quite often find somebody who will step forward and say, we've had a vote and 80 or 90% of the people don't want Sainsbury or Tesco or whatever. Um, but in, it, to take an example, <coughs> that was literally the case. The, in, in the case of that store, that, that already, had a, already existed as a store, already had a planning permission. If it wasn't Tesco, it could be somebody else. Uh, so we opened business there because we have a right, like anybody else, it was an empty shop uh, to, to open business. If 80 or 90% of the people got together and said, look, we don't want to do business here, they don't have to walk across the threshold and we wouldn't be in business for very long. Uh, and um, that's why I know that it isn't actually the case that 80 or 90% of people uh, don't want it. And if you went down to that store, you'd find it doing very good business. And if you spoke to the people, they'd say, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, it's handy. The prices are, are low, cheaper than we've seen before. The service is okay. Yeah, it's quite convenient to use. And that's how it is. I'm impressed by the targets you mentioned on, on their carbon footprints, you know, zero carbon footprints or waste by 2050. Um, in, in another big uh, British uh, multinational, uh, when the CEO changed, uh, a lot of goodwill that was behind those kind of efforts, uh, I think, got dissipated in the organisation. I presume that to have got these targets agreed, you must have been behind them yourself personally. How do you ensure that now that you're no longer there, uh, those kind of issues are still taken equally seriously throughout the business, given especially that shareholders uh, will by their nature, usually have more financial focus. Yeah. Um, well, you're right. To some extent, these things are personal, but they should be. This is what I was saying earlier. You know, a business should reflect <coughs> the judgments uh, and conscience of the people, the stakeholders in, in and around the business. Um, but, but you can see it's embedded into the core strategy of Tesco. These are hard targets that, that, that the business is very committed to. Um, irrespective of who's the CEO. And it, it happens that my um, successor, Philip Clark, is equally committed to these things. Test is obviously one of a number of very successful businesses around the world. Which other business, not in your sector, do you most admire and why? Well, I mean, there's lots to admire in lots of businesses, big and small, because uh, so many businesses, people take enormous personal risk, work fantastically hard uh, in order to create something or to maintain something. Um, you know, 
Uh, Apple is an amazing business at the moment. It's changed the world. Microsoft did before that. Um, Toyota gave the world a whole method of manufacturing. Um, Aldi is a retailer, which is a whole has changed the cost of living for people in Europe. There, there, there are many amazing examples of, of <coughs> businesses that have that have changed uh, the world. And uh, I do a lot of work in China, and uh, it's amazing to go out there, and you're going to see innumerable businesses come out of China, which will be a big force around the world. Right at the back in the blue. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the way I found it worked um, best is actually not to begin with the financial results in that steering wheel, but begin with the customer. And uh, if you create benefit, economic benefit for the customer, uh, that will allow a surplus that will feed through to the financial measurements. Now, originally, share, I have to tell you, shareholders didn't think that was such a good idea. And I used to go to meetings and they'd say, the trouble with you, Leahy, is you're good for customers but not so good for shareholders. But, but over time, they came to accept that actually what was good for customers would end up being good for them. And it's, 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 in my experience, it's not an issue and, and shareholders are 100% behind it. Just in the, in the green. In the end, they're, they're just a series of pretty subjective judgments, is, is the truth. Um, and, and some of all of that, some of it is momentum, what have you done before? Some of it's what's working, so let's do more of it. But some of it is not that. Some of it is a straight commitment that says we're going to spend money on this. So the climate change work from a zero standing start went to hundreds of millions of pounds of commitment where we've changed our whole refrigeration systems, our whole ventilation systems, we put <coughs> tens of millions into research from a standing start. Uh, other things like Race for Life or Computers for School, these have been incremental um, uh, contributions. But th they are subjective judgments, which is why I'm saying earlier that, 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 that businesses do have a conscience and do have to be aware that you're making, you're making judgments all the time. on the wall. That's, that's right, yeah, so this includes all the growth. So that's why you have to get to zero emission, so it doesn't matter how much you grow, <coughs> which, which means we have to decouple from the use of uh, fossil fuels. So in the early years, you can just be more efficient, more energy efficient, things like that, but ultimately, you have to decouple completely. The, the world's going to grow. You know, with the two billion people in India and China who want to live as we are living now, and, and we're not going to be able to stop them. That's what they demand. So the best we can do is find a way of satisfying uh, that universal demand for a better life in a way that doesn't rely on fossil fuels. And I believe it can be done. Uh, but the, the supply chains will need to be rebuilt uh, in order to do it.
somebody has to. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, well, um, don't over plan your, your career. Uh, mine was entirely accidental. Um, I actually applied for another company and didn't get the job, and that's how I tipped up at Tesco. So don't overplan your career. Um, do a job that you like and that matters to you, and, and, and do it to the best of your ability, and have trust in the people around you that they'll spot the contribution you make. <coughs> um, many people can't place that trust in other people, and forever are managing their own career and never stop to enjoy the work that they're doing. They're always so busy thinking about the next promotion or the next job, and it's a shame. And uh, so find work that you like, that you think is worthwhile, work really hard at it, uh, and see where it gets you. And that might include your own business. You know, it, it doesn't have to be in a corporation. If you think something's really interesting or worthwhile, start your own business. And it's a shame that more people don't, don't do that. Take a couple more. Yeah. Two, two more then. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned going green is kind of mandatory for and people definitely put into practices and uh, a lot of it's, you know, corporate social responsibility ends up being PR and some of it's real. Uh, so, with the amount of greenwashing growing on the green space, two questions. One is, how does business? The, the second part, funnily enough, is the easiest part. You, you, you can audit, uh, you, you know, so, 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 the, so the claims that you make about measuring carbon footprints or reducing emissions, these, these can all be measured and, and audited. The, the good thing about carbon emissions is it's relatively <coughs> measurable. Um, the first part is more difficult. Uh, I, I think in, 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 in the end, I think that the greenwash phase will be a short-lived one. I, I think that the pressure uh, will grow quite rapidly. Uh, and also, the companies that genuinely change will be the ones that prosper, and they will be the ones that will be emulated. I, I think the free rider thing won't last for, for long. It's the, it's the same with standards at any period in business, you know, whether it's polluting standards or product <laughs> adulteration or poor working practices. If you look at labor practices, it, you know, it's the businesses that have the best labour practices that engage people more that have done best. One more. This one. Um, I read in the same article that called you um, a very dangerous rapist that you're actually the most powerful, uh, were the most powerful unelected uh, man in Britain. Um, what made you want to give that up? <laughs> the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first one wasn't me, I just want to re-emphasize that. Um, well, um, I, I, I've always had a strong sense that it's Tesco, not me. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't own Tesco, I work for Tesco, or worked for Tesco. And I, I was CEO for 14 years, and it was a great period. But there is a sense that, uh, with anything, that you know that your contribution has been made, that, that you're, you know, you're, you're not really uh, contributing in the way that you might have done in the past. And if you can honestly look at yourself and the business and say, actually, have you done about as much as you can do, then that's the time to move on. The only other thing then is, do you have a successor that you feel will do well and is ready? And I felt that we did at Tesco. So, you know, I've got fantastic memories of Tesco, um, but my life's moved on and I'm doing something else, and it's great fun. Thank you.
I'd just like to pass on our thanks from everyone at Grand Profit as well to firstly all of you for coming to Sector. It's great to see so many people engaging with this sort of stuff and to Terry of course for that brilliant talk. If you think this kind of stuff is interesting and you've been in any way interested in Beyond Profit, please check out our website at www.beyondprofit.org.uk or look for us on Facebook with Cambridge University Beyond Profit. Uh, finally, if you join me in another round of applause for Sir Terry, thank you very much.